Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe. Those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open and my partner Ravinder awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a wonderful chat room with some really great folks that join us every week. So, Ravinder, would you like to tell us all about it? We do have a great chat room and, uh, yeah, it's a great group of people. They all bring something different to the table there. So, you know, we have a great sharing of ideas and different perspectives and bits of humor too so that's kind of fun so if you can come join us as well that would be wonderful that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat but please don't try to join us if you are driving or if your boss is looking over your shoulder i don't want him angry with us too or her cute cute (laughs) all right you also post earls in there as a result of our conversations on the air Uh, you usually show a video and you have an archive, so anyone that can't get to the chat room right now could go back to the chat room later and see all of this. Is that correct? Absolutely. All right. In today's spotlight, I want to open up a discussion regarding the division developing in our country. In my book, Gotcha, the Subordination of Free Will, I fleshed out something Dewey Phyllis, former FBI and chief of police, shared It is the story of how Soviet intelligence planned to corrupt American values, undermine the country, divide its people. A plan that dates back to the 50s. Now, fast forward to more recent disclosures regarding the investigation into Russian meddling in American affairs. It's now publicly known that their agenda, whether messing with our elections or baiting division with a false post on social networking sites is to further divide us and weaken confidence in our system of government. Unfortunately, despite our knowledge, folks seem to continue to take the bait. We only need think of the most recent divisions brought about due to kneeling athletes during our anthem to see the real problem. It's not that athletes or anyone else should be prohibited from demonstrating. That's not the issue. Rather, it's the vitriol and outright hatred that has embroiled both sides of this issue. And there are many more like it. But for example, a recent post on Facebook insisted that those who opposed athletes protesting by kneeling during the anthem is clearly a sample of racist attitudes. Now, the suggestion is clear. If you think we should all stand during our anthem before the flag that is supposed to unite us as Americans, then you must be racist. How you get from respect for the flag to racism is a leap of misunderstanding in my view, but further, Calling out patriotic Americans as racist only serves to further divide our nation and promote hatred. What is to be gained by that? Paraphrasing the book of Matthew, a house divided against itself will soon fall. This is exactly what those who wish to destroy America desire. The truly sad fact is that we all know this, and yet we take the bait and feed the fury. Why not tone down our over-the-top emotions, stop fueling the fire of hatred, and accept that we all do not agree on much of anything, but we are all, nevertheless, Americans. We can work to improve our country this way instead of rip it apart. I have been appalled by the number of folks who teach love is all there is and yet openly share their hatred for this and that calling those who disagree with them the nastiest names and recruiting others to do the same. 
It's a sad and dissonant practice to promote hatred and division under the guise of peace and love. For what it's worth, there is plenty of room in my life for those who disagree with me and my perspectives. However, hate is not only self-destructive, it is an effective force gained by those who rejoice when America fails, that we play into when we promote hate for one another. There are far better ways to disagree than to dip into the pail of hatred. Let's all remember to respect one another, for that old adage embraced in the golden rule and articulated this way by the famous television show host, Art Leakletter, and I quote, My philosophy is to do the best you can for somebody. Help. It's not just what you do for yourself, it's how you treat people decently, the golden rule. There isn't a big anything better than the golden rule, it's in every major religion in one language or another. Close quote. It, that statement is more relevant today than perhaps it's been in my lifetime. Those are my thoughts. I welcome yours. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last live show featured a discussion about self-sabotaging patterns. Mary wrote, Thank you, Eldon and Ravinder, for sharing so much valuable information. Your shows are always amazing. Loretta wrote, I so appreciate you both for all the wonderful information you provide and the tools to help in all ways. Beth wrote, very interesting show. I love hearing about how my mind works, and this show was most enlightening. Moving on, L wrote, my experience with your self-sabotage album has been positively remarkable. I was going to purchase the weight loss CDs last week to enhance my husband's weight loss. Instead, I decided to get him started on the self-sabotage album. I did purchase and start the Healing from Abuse album. My thoughts are, get informed on self-sabotage and get the Inner Talk album. Well, I like that. How about you, Ravinder? I do indeed. Joanne wrote, I have your Inner Talk program, Healing from Invalidation. It is amazing how it helped me shift my perspective of myself. I like the nature CDs and put them on repeat to listen all night while sleeping. Thank you, Eldon and Ravinder. I have so many of your CDs. You have truly helped change my life. And Robert wrote, many times in counseling, we see destructive behavior, are at a loss to how to deal with the individual. Eldon's programs allow an overall concept of well-being, well-being, something that is so necessary in order to deal with destructive behavior. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but we do love your comments, so please keep them coming. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do appreciate your thoughts and ideas. All right, now to today's show, The Seven Cents, Power, Fortune, and Survival in the Age of Networks, with best-selling author Joshua Cooper Ramo. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Joshua Cooper Ramo is co-CEO of Kissinger Associates, the advisory firm of former U.S. Secretary of State, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Based in Beijing and New York, Ramo serves as an advisor to some of the largest companies and investors in the world. He is a member of the boards of directors of Starbucks and FedEx. A Mandarin speaker who is also called one of China's leading foreign-born scholars, by the World Economic Forum, Ramo is best known for coining and articulating the Beijing Consensus, among other writings on China. His views on global politics and economics have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Time, Foreign Policy, and Fortune. He has been a frequent guest on CNN, CNNBC, NBC, and PBS, and in 2008, he served as China analyst for NBC during the Beijing Olympic Games. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Joshua Cooper Ramo. Hi there. How are you? I am excellent, sir. I enjoyed your book. I've got to tell you right now, it it basically reads fast, like you're going through a fiction book, and yet it's it's just packed with ideas that I want to flesh out during our show. Well, but I'm so before... pleased to hear that. I, I know you're an avid reader, so uh, that praise means a lot. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, we like to know three things on the show, uh, Joshua. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And how do we use it? 
So let's begin, if we can, by having you tell us about yourself and your passions. Boy, it's an interesting question to to talk about. Uh, I mean, I almost want to ask you a bunch of questions about that that same subject for you. Um, I, what can I tell you to be the most helpful in that regard? Well, I think you know your passions. Uh, I, it's pretty clear that you uh, you speak Mandarin, so you spent a great deal of time in China. But I think our listeners would like to know a little more about that. And of course, I'm going to ask you later about some of your practices. Uh, what most of our leaders will, or our listeners will know is Zen practices, the Japanese. I, that's not, uh, but we'll get into that later. But I, you know, kind of give us a background and then tell us what you're most passionate about today. Sure. Well, you know, we're living just in such an extraordinary time in so many ways. Uh, I, I think you hinted at it even a little bit in your opening segment, just the kind of changes that are under unfolding in the world and the way it's forcing us to kind of constantly look at things in new and fresh and different ways. So I, I think for me, it's, uh, you know, always that sense of adventure and experience and trying to sort of understand the changes that are going on in the world around us and then what we can do to try to guide those changes to make the world better. It's obviously a time where there's any number of things that are going on that uh, have the potential to make things radically better or radically worse, and we all have the responsibility to try to make sure it's the former and not the latter. Let, let me ask you this. You heard today's spotlight. What are your thoughts on, you know, the division and the vitriol, the, the hatred promulgated uh, in our country today? Well, I mean, I think the, we are living through a period of kind of unprecedented changes, and I think that is liberating a lot of people's fears. Uh, and, I, I, you know, one of the, the things you discover in life is you really want to try to avoid having people be fearful or dealing with people when they're in a period where they're afraid because they just, you know, people just retreat to their kind of most fundamental base reactions and don't think much more broadly than that. So. I think it's, you know, I think what we're seeing, unfortunately, is symptomatic of just a larger insecurity that, that people are having about where things are going in the world. It's certainly a justified insecurity in some ways because things are changing very dramatically. But we haven't yet arrived at a point where I think people feel comfortable being optimistic and open and curious and engaged with one another in a way that, uh, you know, that, that leads to a much healthier kind of discourse. And certainly, it's a discourse most people would recognize as, as what has marked the United States for such a long time. You travel the world, and I think anybody that looks at, you know, what's going on in the world, has any kind of political science background, could say, this isn't just an American phenomenon. I mean, maybe Brexit is an example of, of it in Europe. Uh, as a result of your travels and your interface with uh, others uh, in different countries, is this a worldwide phenomenon now? I think there's a shift going on, which is, Related to much of what I talked about, my that kind of boosting for how it is that works with all kinds or connections with all kinds are changing our lives, which is we're finding we're connected to and understand and think so wonderful things kind of unnerving things in our lives at the same time. So, uh, you know, it is a worldwide phenomenon. I think the Brexit is an example of this. I think the, uh, you know, the instinct of people to build walls or how they think about refugees. Reflecting, I think, this concern people have about how open are we, how closed are we to the rest of the world. And I think that's a question you see almost everywhere. You know, it's interesting if you look at the construction of, of kind of gates or walls, things like the Berlin Wall. This is one of the things I talk about in my book. Uh, you know, there have been, I think, 51 uh, kind of wall like structures constructed in the world since the end of the Second World War. And over 80% of those have been constructed in the last 15 years. So we do seem to see an accelerating pace of people trying to manage this kind of connected, not connected, you know, in or out uh, sort of question because it is so fundamental to everything from identity to, uh, to economics. But, it's a, you know, it's, it's a very different uh, spirit than the one that most of us know, uh, you know, having animated the world since the end of the Cold War, which is really about the fall of the Iron Curtain and more and more connection, people being more and more open to being connected to one another. We're starting to see the tension back in the other direction. Interesting. Uh, let's let's turn to your book. I guess the most important first question, and, and this is a, a general overall question, and we'll deal with some specificity in a moment, but tell our readers, in your view, 
And I'll tell them right now, I think every one of them should read your book, but tell them why they should, would you please? Well, uh, maybe a better reason. I, you know, I can tell you why I wrote it, and I maybe I hope everybody can make up their mind to either read it or not. I mean, I, we're doing pretty well. I think we're the ninth hardback printing of the book now, and it's, uh, like I mentioned, it's both the Times and Washington Post bestseller. And I think the reason for that is that it does try to address this kind of core question of why is it that the world is changing in ways that are sort of unpredictable and surprising. And, you know, the, the basic argument that I make in the book is that the act of connecting anything changes its nature in a very profound way. So a connected doctor, a connected patient, a connected student or a voter, it's just different than one that's not connected, right, in the way that a connected, you know, radio show is different or a connected telephone is different depending on what it's connected to. And so I think all of our lives are different today as a result of what we're connected to. We've got real-time information streaming in at us. We're you know, sharing our, our own information back into these systems. In some ways, it's very helpful, but in other ways, also maybe a little bit worrying. And what I tried to really discover in the book is kind of what does that actually mean? Say the connection changes the nature of an object, that it shifts power in our society, it changes where jobs are going to come from, how we ought to educate our children, what do we mean practically about that? And I sort of look at it at the beginning from a historical perspective, which is this idea that the last time we had such a major shift in power was really during the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And it, at the end of that period, uh, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche came up with this idea that you know, our five senses were not enough to make sense of the world because everything was so new. You know, if you were living in 1890, you were confronted with many things, from trains, the city, the, you know, beyond your expectation. And so Nietzsche said we did what he called a sixth sense, which was a feeling for history to kind of keep our, keep our sanity. Uh, my book is called The Seventh Sense because I think in addition to a feeling for history, we need to have an understanding of how these networks work. And I, and I, I guess my argument is by networks, I mean things that are connected to each other. So the Internet is a network, the uh, the place where your medical data is being shared is a network. The, the, the things that your children are using online are networks. Financial markets are networks. But also, you know, people who live in Beijing is a network. Uh, people who use a certain kind of operating system, a certain computer language is a network. And I, I think understanding the logic of those systems is very important. What I found as I looked around the world, as I traveled around, is that there were certain people who had the ability to look at something and see how it was changed by connections. That you and I might look at a car and just think, okay, that's a car, but the guys who started Uber looked at it and said, boy, when you connect that car and driver, it radically changes the economics and you build the largest you know, car company in the world without actually ever owning any cars. Or the guys who started Airbnb could look at an unused bedroom and understand that when you connect that, you can suddenly virtually build a very powerful business. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the Russians looked at the United States and saw the way that the people were connected for information and political systems and thought there's a way to... To, to have an influence on that that didn't exist before because connection to change the nature of the system. So what I mean by the seven senses is that ability to look at anything, whether it's a car or a political system or your own career, and understand how it's going to be changed or eliminated or strengthened as a result of this kind of revolution of connectivity that, that really is just beginning today. I mean, today we've got seven or eight billion connected devices in the world, and you know, in the next 20 or 30 years that, that number will grow. Uh, you know, tenfold, and we will be surrounded by connected devices all the time, and uh, that'll change a lot about the logic of, of, of how we think about our own lives. You, you mentioned Nietzsche, and of course, Nietzsche's six sense um, admonitions were largely ignored, and you you make a correlation with that in your book, uh, bringing up that you know what we have because they were ignored. We had first and second world wars. Now, we recently interviewed Parag Khanna on this show. And his position is democracy is failing. Um, and, and do you share that view? And do you have an outlook that does suggest we're headed in a direction that may well be a complete change in the way we, America, the world itself, is governed? You know, I think it's very hard to say democracy is failing. I, you know, I mean, I, it is uh, still has produced a nation that is, you know, in the United States that is dynamic and inclusive and, uh, you know, is going through a, uh, you know, what I, I think people have, what many people think is a temporary kind of spasm in a way, but it's a long way from saying that the system of democracy itself has, has failed. I, I think it is a test for the system of democracy, and, you know, it's still too early to, to, to know whether or not the system will come through it, but I'm, I'm certainly optimistic that it will. The, the longer-range question that I think is important is to say, 
you know, the reality is that systems like democracy and capitalism were very much engineered for the challenges of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you know, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution really produced, uh, you know, what you might think of as kind of a convergence club and a divergence club and the convergence club of nations that became scientific, industrial, uh, you know, urban, rich, all c- converged on a certain type of political and economic system, which was mostly democracy and, and, and mostly capitalism, because that was the, the core element for success in that period really was the liberation of the individual and every struggle, the wars of independence you know, around the world, the desire for Indians to be independent, the desire for you know women to come into the workplace, to have everybody treated equally, all of that was about liberating people. And the structures that did that best uh, were very successful. The U.S. was probably the best example of that as a country. It didn't matter where you came from or who your parents were. You sort of had a chance to get ahead. You know, you could ask yourself, is it true that the same systems that were built for an era where the liberation of the individual was the most important thing will be successful in an era where the connection of the individual is every bit as important? Because we all do crave to be connected to these systems today more and more because they bring huge advantages. Um, and it's, I think it is an open question for one worth to asking, you know, what is the political system that is really best designed for an era where... Uh, you know, while people care about being free and having liberty and, you know, and having justice in their society, they also care a great deal about being connected to certain kinds of systems. I, I guess I'm forced to ask this just as a follow up. But you know, when you look at the instability in the world and then you look at what we generally term as rogue nations, North Korea, Iran, uh, the development of nuclear weapons, uh, and all this rhetoric that's going on. Uh, does that concern you uh, with regard to uh, the realization that we're not stabilizing, we're actually becoming more unstable on a daily basis? You know, there's an opportunity, I think, in, in, a, in a debate to sort of articulate a view of the world, kind of a grand strategy from the U.S. perspective that's designed to stabilize. I mean, I think your point is exactly right. If you look through history, we know the consequences of a dramatically destabilized system and how, how, how horrible and tragic they can be. And I think it's not wrong to say that today we're not articulating a vision of global leadership. We're not articulating a, a sense of kind of what a, what a future world order ought to look like. And at the same time, the system itself is becoming more and more complicated and more and more unstable as a result. Uh, unstable because we're confronting problems we've never seen before in human history. Uh, and that the number of actors and people who are connected together in this world is greater than ever before. Having said that, there are, and I talk a lot about this in, in the book, there are certain rules we know about the way the world is working now that you can understand and that are very useful for trying to answer exactly the sorts of questions that, that you're you're raising. So, you know, I think the the right way to say it is, is to say, okay, you know, whether it's Iran or North Korea, these, these are not existential threats to the United States. They're not going to wipe out the United States. The main threat really is the evolution of the international system itself. And, and that's the question we ought to be spending an awful lot of time on, is saying what do we want the world order to look like and, uh, you know, and, and evolve into over, over the next period of time, and can we influence that, and how do we influence that? And once you have a sense of that, then I think the, the management of questions like North Korea or Iran or proliferation or cyber weapons or any number of problems becomes a lot clearer. But the problem today is we don't always have a clear picture of what we're trying to get to. Interesting. I want to pursue that a little more when we come back from the break. We're speaking with Joshua Cooper Ramo about his book, The Seventh Sense. Uh, I, I would suggest every one of you out there get a copy of this book and read it through. We've talked about connectivity in the past. We've talked about reliance on all this technology and what we're giving up in the, in, in return for that. There is no more compelling work that I have read than The Seventh Sense. Go get a copy of it. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at joshuacooperramo.com. Now we have a video for you in our chat room featuring an overview of our guest book. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get on over there, and you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Okay, do please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, 
Intertalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love Intertalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used Intertalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Joshua Cooper Ramo about his book, The Seventh Sense. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Joshua Cooper Ramo, R-A-M-O dot com. Now we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology, as you know by now, is a avocation of mine. Indeed, I'm doing a book on it. It is a relevant area. Uh, of research and relevant in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So we just played some of MV by Fei Wong. Tell us, Joshua, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Oh, well, first of all, I didn't realize you were writing a book about music and psychology. I, I couldn't agree more. It is such an interesting way to understand how the human mind works, both your own and other people. I mean, just the power of music is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, you know, Wang Fei is a, uh, or Fei Wang is her English name. Uh, a uh, Anybody who was in and around China over the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so uh, knows her and her music. And uh, uh, I moved to Beijing in uh, 2002. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, hearing uh, uh, Fei Wang or Wang Fei song, just was kind of part of the tapestry of my life of getting settled into China, which is you know one of the most important uh, experiences I've been fortunate enough to have in my life. And uh, you all have to send me a note saying what's your favorite song. Just a few days after I'd been uh, sort of transported back to back to those days by listening to her music, and uh, you know she's just a you probably heard from that little excerpt a very interesting and sort of ethereal singer who combines a lot of sort of traditional Chinese ways of of thinking and singing with sort of Western style music and uh, sounds great. So I, I'm not sure it's a it's a piece that has a broad resonance for people who aren't in China necessarily in that time, but uh, uh, for people of my generation, there uh, her, her music really was kind of a soundtrack for us. This is a love song. Do you have it attached to anything? Romance, a sweetheart. I would just say it's attached to uh, you know the ins and outs of life in Asia over a, a decade or so and. In every respect, it's, uh, I, I don't know if you've spent much time in Asia, but it is a, it is a magical and very special place, and, and China in particular certainly is a, is, is a wonderful and special country in many ways. All right. You share, let's, let's deal with your time in China, and, how, and especially, and then we'll come full back. In fact, you deal with it in your book, so we're really not straying. But you share a story of the Chuan Master, or what most know as the Japanese Zen tradition, as I mentioned earlier. Master Non and his view that our current era has a sickness. Please share with our audience who this person is or was. Uh, I understand he's passed away. Uh, how he influenced your thinking and what, you know, the point of his message intended. Sure. So, uh, you know, when I moved to China, somebody gave me this amazing advice, which is they said, look, as important it is that you're bilingual, you also really need to be bicultural. And... As a result of that, I made a, a real attempt to just spend all my time with, with Chinese and very little time with expats and developed a lot of very close Chinese friends who are, you know, remain my closest friends uh, today. And through one of them, I was introduced to Nan Huai Qin and Master Nan, as he was known, 
uh, who passed away a couple of years ago at age 95, was really one of the great contemporary Chinese philosophical minds. He was a guy who kind of had studied any number of uh, uh, you know, Chinese Buddhist traditions. China, of course, has these three very deep philosophical traditions of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. And Master Nan was really adept in all of them, as well as being a practitioner of many different kinds of meditation uh, and many different ideas about how one might reach enlightenment. And uh, in China, he's quite well known. I mean, his books have sold you know, hundreds of millions of copies and was known as an advisor uh, and spiritual mentor to some of the top leaders in, in the country. When I spent time with Master Nan, it was really just to deepen my own understanding of, of a particular uh, style of Buddhism and a little bit about Confucianism, which for the Western mind often is a, is a, is a particular challenge. And as I was working on this book, sort of thinking about what was going on in the world, Master Nan at one point said something to me uh, that sort of stayed in my mind. And he said, look, you know, if you look at history, you often have these massive changes that the world struggles to adjust to. So he says, you know, in the 19th century, you had all these people who were suddenly forced into urban settings. And the result was, you know, disease and pneumonia and social dissatisfaction because they simply weren't prepared for what life was like with so many people packed so closely together. He said, in the 20th century, we began dragging science into people's lives and pulling them away from nature. And, you know, one of the things you saw as a result of that was this sickness of the 20th century, which was really, you know, cancer that became a much worse problem than in the past. And he said, in the 21st century, what's happening is people are all connected now to these machines and devices and networks, and their minds are simply not prepared for it. And the great disease of the 21st century is going to be spiritual illness, uh, that people's minds simply can't get, keep up with it. And he said, you see that already in people's confusion and fear and the way that institutions all around are suffering from their own kind of spiritual illness, not doing what they were designed to do. And uh, that was a very insightful view, I thought, and, and it was right that we are seeing a lot of institutions which are struggling in the face of kind of new demands of power, and that was really the, the, the story I set out to tell with the book. Why is it that so few of our institutions today are more trusted than they were a decade or so ago, and what can we do about it, and why is it these incredibly powerful new forces seem to be emerging, and, and what do they mean? You, you know, it, it, it occurs to me that with the devices, people have become less intelligent. I mean, you can Google anything, so why remember it, you know? And yeah. you, you, you can look it up uh, as you read your Kindle. There's a word you don't know. You just click on it, and, you know, it tells you what it is. So why bother with writing it down, learning the word, you, using the word, all the things that you and I have been taught to do? Uh, and, and so I guess what I'm asking is, do you think the dumbing down effect... Uh, together with this connectivity, uh, underlies some of the ramifications you, ex you you expose in your book? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important part of it. It, it is that we are, in many ways, feeding decision-making memories. I mean, you think you put all of your photos on the Internet, now they're on the cloud somewhere. Uh, you know, all of your data is up there. Uh, more and more of that we're giving away to, to technology. And to technologically driven systems because in many ways they do perform better or do things that we couldn't do or give us more time. They're more efficient than the old way of doing things. But the price of that is that we're kind of getting out of touch with it. And that's only going to accelerate because the emergence of big data and artificial intelligence means that the machines will be better and faster at making all kinds of decisions for us. And so the human mind and the role of the human mind and the question of how you keep it sharp and use it and what its comparative advantage is compared to the machine is really still a very open question. But what we're seeing now as kind of the dumbing down is, is just a surface symptom of a much larger shift in, in kind of where power sits and also how easily you know, each of us can now be manipulated because we, we've come to rely on these systems whose governance we don't necessarily understand and in many cases isn't even understood by the people who constructed them. It, it seems to me, and correct me, I mean, Clearly, you know, if you disagree, but it seems to me that this dumbing down process makes us all the more vulnerable to the kinds of attacks that are, you know, the Soviet or the Russians, I should say, uh, allegedly carried out. I guess allegedly isn't even proper anymore, but carried out during this last uh, couple of years in social networking and 
And um, that vulnerability leads to um, added instability. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's right. So I, I think that's, that's – and it's also leads to – I mean, it is – and some of it's coming down and some of it's just plain connection, which is the more we depend on these systems, the easier they are to be hijacked and manipulated or, or hacked. And so some of it is – Right, we're not thinking about it, but sometimes we've just chosen to, to, to endow these systems with a with an amount of power that's unusual. I think you can make the case that companies like Google and Facebook are some of the most powerful entities that have ever existed in human history. And you know, now we're I think beginning to wake up to the question of what that means. But it's really not obvious how you answer that. I mean, if you look at something like Google, its strength comes from the fact that it has almost a monopolistic position. If you know you or me or somebody we know, you know, we. God forbid, has some disease, and you have it desperately or eager to get an answer to what's going on. Of course, you want to use a system that has access to billions of people. And so, you know, the traditional model of saying, well, let's break it up into lots of smaller systems uh, would be ineffective. It would be socially, uh, it would be suboptimal in terms of the result. And so, you sort of have this very difficult trade off we have to face between the efficacy of the systems and the amount of power they control and how best to regulate them. And that, that'll only become more. Uh, in the future, as these systems become more sophisticated and more centrally embedded in our lives, um, you know, one way to think about it is there was a period, you know, maybe around 1890 or so, during the Industrial Revolution, where you really could have just stopped the Industrial Revolution and people's lives would have been okay. I mean, you could have stopped the trains and the factories and people still had the ability to go back to the farms. And obviously, nobody did it, but there was sort of this tipping point after which things were never the same. And we're kind of in the same space today with the information revolution, which is today, if we took away everybody's phones and internet connections, I mean, I think we'd kind of be all right. We'd go back to doing the way the things, the way we did them four or five years ago. But I'll tell you, five years or 10 years from now, that'll be impossible. We depend so much on these systems for our health, for our finance, for information, that we're not going to be able to unplug from them. And so the question is, how do you begin to think about and understand and navigate them? And that's that's this thing I call the seventh sense, which is really what the book is about, which is, you know, what are the skills you need in order to, to make sense of a world where connectivity is, is really a, an essential part, really the definition of everything you do in your life, whether it's as a citizen, as a voter, as, a, as an economic actor, as somebody who's trying trying to learn. But it does require a very different way of thinking. You know, as far as I'm concerned, your book is relevant, you know, obviously on a nation state level, uh, you know, globally. But it also has relevance on a personal level. Um, if I understand your writing correctly, Master Nan he essentially is telling us that the disease of our century is insanity. So one of your techniques is called hard gatekeeping. I, a two-part question. How do we master the problem of insanity? And please flesh out for us what you mean by hard gatekeeping. Sure. So I, I think the... Your, 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 your comment is quite perceptive, which is, you know, what is true for the whole system is true for the individual. I mean, I think it even, you know, goes back yes. to look at like Plato's Republic, right? That it is, right. uh, that there's a certain logic that runs through everything. And I think that is the great question. The Republic was how do you organize the state? But it was really a way of asking how do you organize yourself in your own life? And I think the same is true here in a world of connection. How do you manage the state? But then how do each of us proceed with our own lives? And I, I think what I've tried to spell in the book is, a little bit of the answer to that, which is, you know, what are the, that the strategy is not to become more like the machines because you'll never compete with them, but in a way is to become more human and more, uh, more compassionate and more caring and more engaged in the world and more feeling a sense of responsibility to maintain, uh, you know, stability and equality and all these things which we know are, are very conducive to the productive growth of, of society. And, you know, I think that is the, 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 the best way to try to deal with it. But the insanity he's talking about is right. Uh, there is a uh, there's a wildness that's alive in the system today because things are collapsing and nobody knows who they can trust anymore. I mean, never, I think, had a period where so many institutions in the United States were not, you know, considered, uh, you know, legitimate or respected. I mean, the approval numbers for the media, for Congress, for scientists, but never had a period where simultaneously all these things were not trusted by citizens, and that uh, puts a tremendous psychological pressure on everybody because to live in an era where you have increasing problems uh, and institutions that are clearly not capable of solving them, uh, it's, it's no surprise that people react to that with a tremendous amount of stress. The, the networks themselves, though, do have a certain internal logic, uh, and you know, one way to think about it is that they are these 
very complex connected system, but they don't just destroy things. They also produce things, right? Once, and, and I use in the book ideas from chaos theory or complexity theory to talk about this, which is, you know, once you had a billion people connected, it was inevitable there would be a Google or something like a Google. It's what we call an emergent property of a complex adaptive system, that when you have lots of things connected, certain things actually do emerge. There are structures that occur. It's not just chaos. When you had two billion people, it was probably inevitable you'd have something like Facebook. So it's not to take anything away from the guys who started Google or Facebook, but to understand that things do actually emerge out of these systems, that there are certain regularities that can be understood and that can tell you everything from how you got to invest your money to what the you know the, the future kind of directions of politics will look like. One of the things that emerges in these systems is this sort of debate between in and out. And there's a temptation you know, to just kind of build walls or to have the Brexit reaction of saying, look, we just want to totally unplug our, ourselves. But a better reaction rather than just in or out is instead to think about having gates, which is how do you design network systems in your own life so that you are sometimes connected and sometimes not connected, but in any event are in control of that decision of whether you're connected and what you're connected to. And so that's really what I mean by hard gatekeeping. I, I apply it in the book very much to problems of foreign policy and the question of sort of how you would build a world order that was designed for the network age, because these networks do crave gates. They crave that division between in and out. But it does also reflect on our own lives. Like, do we have the ability to control what are we seeing? How are we seeing it? How are we thinking about it? Let me ask in a more personal sense, yourself, you're a student of and or practitioner of Satori, that tradition. What do you personally do to manage this gate system? I think your your line in your book is, if you're not a gatekeeper, you're gate-capped. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what do you personally do? I mean, because that has relevance to everyone listening today. If they're, you know, if they're not in business and they're not in government and they just have that 9-to-5 job or what have you, you know, uh, as as you already pointed out, uh, I think of it the same way you do. It, it is the individual that makes up the larger group, the larger group that makes up the collective, the collective, and so forth. So if if we're going to change anything above, we're going to have to change that that begins personally below. What do you per, what, what do you yourself do? So I I, I think that the most and, and obviously this is a everybody has their own needs to find their own path. So it, it's such a personal question. Um, you know, for me, it is the, the cultivation of a real kind of inner stillness and calm, um, which is very generative. Uh, you know, in the Chinese tradition, there's this idea of the yin and the yang, right? This sort of balance and the right. yin energy, which is associated with kind of stillness or, or, or great, you know, bodies of water, great lakes, just great calmness, cultivating that kind of basin of stability and silence and quietness inside yourself so that you can access at any time. Uh, the more chaotic, the more uncertain, the more disruptive the external world gets, the more you have to balance that out by just cultivating that silence on the inside. Um, so for me, that really is the essential trick. And, and, and that permits you to do two things. First of all, it when you are still like that, you have the ability to think without or not even think, but even just have an intuition or, or, or find your way forward without fear uh, and without any you know, bias or judgment, but just to kind of watch and observe and not feel like you're being swept along, uh, you know, to make that decision, to have some distance from it. And, and the second thing is that, you know, in Chinese philosophy, once you cultivate that great stillness, many things become visible. It's like if you are you were a giant still lake and somebody dropped a pebble somewhere in it, you would have a feeling for the ripples of those pebbles long before, uh, you know, anybody might on a far distant shore. And so that quietness also gives you an ability to sense the underlying energy, the underlying movements and currents of, of the age. And that's very important because I, I think if you believe that almost everything we see around us today is a, is a symptom of larger moving currents, Rather than just worrying about the surface of what you're seeing in front of you, people losing their jobs or natural disasters or uh, amazing billion-dollar fortunes created out of nowhere or incredible medical miracles, you can instead focus on the underlying forces that are producing those. 
Uh, you know, I want to pursue that just a little bit because if you look out into the world and you look at behavior, you have to see that, you know, we seem to have a fifth force, a fifth drive. You know, the old psychology, fight, flight, feeding, and fornication. Well, we have this fifth one in it. And that fifth one is, I think of it as more. You know, we're, we're out there consuming. Uh, we're, we become consumer so consumer oriented that taking the time just pausing to become mindful to find that stillness to get out of the chaos of of the noise that going on in our culture it's just something that that um, we don't see very commonly and i'm reminded of something in your book i just opened it up because what you were saying reminded me of this you say and i'm quoting in trading our liberty for convenience, we are spending that inheritance too fast now, too blindly. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, I, I think it's very it's very relevant to the point you just made, which is, I mean, all of us now, uh, I mean, first of all, on the consumption point, I mean, I think we live in an era where we're just have been told for so long that if you consume more, you'll be happier, uh, which I think almost anybody who you know, thinks about that, understands is not the case, and in fact, maybe makes things a lot worse. The point I was trying to make there is that this this liberty that we have, this freedom that we have, is very hard won. It, it's not, if you look throughout human history, it's an incredible gift to have the ability to think freely and speak freely and, and, and really enjoy the liberty of making up your own minds about things. But as we more and more come to rely on these connected systems, we're starting to give that up. Uh, you know, if you'd said to me 10 years ago, look, I'm going to give you a device to carry with you everywhere, <clears throat> and it will track all of your movements. And in exchange for that, it might occasionally save you five or six minutes in traffic. Would you like that device? I'd have to say not in a million years. I you know, would never want such an Orwellian thing on me. But it's exactly what your phone is today, right? And we all use Google Maps, and it's a miracle that we have this thing that can tell us how to get one place to the other and watches traffic for us. But we've traded off our liberty, uh, our freedom to control our own information about where we are in exchange for the convenience. And I, I think that's a, a thing we've done in many different areas of, of our lives, and we've done it really without necessarily thinking about the implications of it. I couldn't agree more. This very powerful book. One of your bottom lines insists that we need to be humane citizens. We only have a, a minute or two, but if you can, unpack exactly what you mean by a humane citizen for us, sir. Sure. You know, one of the things you were asking me earlier is sort of what is the, how do we think about that line, of, you know, what we ought to do, and particularly in an age where the machines are doing more and more, what is it we can do? And I think that sense of compassion, we have so much. Uh, the resources we have available to us are just unprecedented. And if we continue to look at it from this narrow perspective of how much can I get myself, as opposed to saying how much can I do to stabilize and improve and help those around me, uh, then we're really going to have a systemic crisis. And that cultivating that sense of humanity, the sense that all things are connected, and, and we say that, and it sounds like a network thing today, right? All things are connected. Your refrigerator is connected, your air conditioner, your car. But but there's a deeper Buddhist sense, for instance, and I think it's true in many religions, that all things are connected to a fundamental nature source. And what happens in Africa or what happens in Puerto Rico or what happens in New York City matters to all of us uh, and matters to this sense of collective value. And I think once you begin to cultivate the humane and kind and decent reaction to that reality, uh, it begins to help you navigate the challenges of a world where everything really is connected technologically and not just to some, you know, mythical spiritual force. All right. I want everyone to know how they can get your book, learn more about you and so forth. So take 30, 40 seconds and share that with our audience, please. Sure. You know, the book, uh, as I mentioned, is now, I think, in a ninth hardback printing. You can get it on Amazon or your local bookstore. And uh, there's a written book, there's an audio book, which actually just won an award. Um, and uh, you can always find you know, stuff at uh, joshuacooperamo.com, uh, and those are probably the best places to go. And once again, I'm going to tell you, uh, this is a powerful book. I think every one of you will benefit as a result of reading. 
the book, The Seventh Sense. Our guest has been Joshua Cooper Ramo, and I want to thank you, Joshua, for your willingness to share your work with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Keep up the good work. Glad to. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends, let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.